This is the Biblical Unitarian Podcast. Hello, truth seekers, and welcome to the Biblical Unitarian Podcast, the podcast that aims to start conversations about the oneness and unity of God and about the humanity of Jesus. My name is Dustin Smith, and as always, I will be your host. This is episode 318, entitled John's Use of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verse 20. Having borne some exegetical fruit in our ongoing study of the many ways in which the Gospel of John illustrates Jesus as the prophet like Moses from Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 through 22, this week's episode will closely examine Deuteronomy 18, verse 20. The passage reads, But the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. So, if the true prophet like Moses is to be known by the words of Yahweh that he speaks, then how is the community of Israel to discern if a prophet is wrongly claiming inspiration from Yahweh? This week's episode will demonstrate how the Jews took the mandate stated in Deuteronomy 18 verse 20 and applied it to Jesus within the narrative of the Gospel of John. The way in which Deuteronomy 18 verse 20 applies to the plot of the Gospel of John has been severely overlooked by interpreters for far too long. So, in what ways does the fourth gospel portray Jesus as a false prophet in the eyes of his opponents, worthy of being put to death? What sort of things did Jesus say and do that led to so many concluding that he was not the prophet like Moses? Was Jesus rejected by the Jews for claiming to be God? What were the ongoing consequences for those who followed Jesus, this presumed false prophet, according to Jesus' opponents? Let's find out on this week's episode of the Biblical Unitarian Podcast. Our first point today is Jesus is accused of speaking and acting presumptuously. So remember, in Deuteronomy 18, verse 20, it says that a prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, that is, in the name of Yahweh, which Yahweh has not commanded him to speak, that prophet must die. So, there is a lot of evidence in the Gospel of John that Jesus is accused of doing just that, of acting presumptuously and speaking presumptuously, specifically by claiming prerogatives from the only true God that Jesus' opponents felt that Jesus did not legitimately possess. And that's one of the major issues that brings about conflict in the Gospel of John. Jesus claims to bear authority and privileges and prerogatives from God. He claims to truly have been sent from God as God's Messiah, but his opponents think that Jesus is a fake. They think that he is a messianic pretender. They think that Jesus is making claims to have this status as someone who has truly been sent from God, but that Jesus is lying. So we could see much of this. Let's just pick one example in particular. Let's start in chapter 5, verse 14 of the Gospel of John. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, you have become well. Do not sin any more, so that nothing worse happens to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. For this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But he answered them, My father is working until now, and 
and I myself am working. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. Therefore Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in a like manner. That's John 5, verses 14 through 19. So it's pretty clear here. Jesus heals somebody on the Sabbath. When that is brought into question, Jesus says that his Father is working on the Sabbath, and he, as an obedient and faithful son, he is just doing what the Father is doing. And so he's claiming to do something that the Father is doing. They don't think that that is true. They think that he's breaking the Sabbath, and they think that he is calling God his own Father in a way that would make himself equal with God. Notice they are accusing Jesus of making himself on par with God. But Jesus' response is not, yes, it's true. He actually says that he does nothing by himself. He only does things that he sees the Father doing first. And whatever the Father does, he imitates in like manner. So that's how Jesus responds to the claim that he actually is not legitimately obeying the Father and bearing the prerogatives of the Father to do work on the Sabbath. We can see a bit more of this in chapter 7, starting in verse 22. This alludes back to what had already happened in chapter 5. In chapter 7, verse 22, it says, For this reason Moses has given you circumcision, not because it is from Moses, but from the fathers, and on the Sabbath you circumcise a man. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath, so that the law of Moses will not be broken, are you angry with me because I made an entire man well on the Sabbath? That's John 7, verses 22 through 23. So here Jesus indicating that Moses, the authoritative prophet and mediator of the covenant, has given the Jewish people a command that they need to circumcise a man, even if that moment of circumcision falls on the Sabbath, and thereby they are doing well to a small part of a man's body on the Sabbath in a way that actually negates the requirement of the Sabbath. And so Jesus says, if that's okay, if you could do that in obedience to Moses, then what's wrong with me making an entire person well on the Sabbath? And of course, Jesus says that he is doing this, as he mentioned back in chapter 5, because he sees the Father doing good on the Sabbath, and Jesus, as an obedient son, is going to follow suit. In chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus says, Then again he spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisee said to him, you are testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not true. That's John 8, verses 12 through 13. Jesus claims to possess the light of life. That is a prerogative that God has. God is able to, of course, create life and, of course, to create light. But God has given those prerogatives over to Jesus. Jesus is now the light of the world, and Jesus has the ability to give life. He has already given life to the sick man on the Sabbath back in chapter 5. But the Pharisees respond by saying that you're just saying this about yourself, and they disagree with that. They say your testimony is not valid. And of course, Jesus is going to respond by saying that the Father actually has given him this authority. A little later in the chapter, in verse 53, they respond to Jesus by saying, Surely you are not greater than our father Abraham who died. The prophets died too. Whom do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my father who 
who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. That's chapter 8, verses 53 through 54. So, again, notice the language here. Whom do you make yourself out to be? We saw that back in chapter 5. They accused Jesus of making himself out to be on par with God. They think that Jesus is making this claim on his own without actually bearing the authority and prerogatives and privileges from God. They think that Jesus is just making this claim as a rebellious son. They think that he is speaking and acting presumptuously. So, of course, the question here is that Abraham died, the prophets died, whom do you make yourself out to be? And Jesus' response is not, hey, I'm God, I can say and do whatever I want. He says that my glory is nothing if I glorify myself. It's my Father who glorifies me. And then Jesus says that his Father is the one of whom the Jews claim he is our God. So the God of Jesus is also the God of the Jewish people. So Jesus says that, hey, your God is my Father. He doesn't say that I am your God. He's indicating here that the Father is the one who is glorifying Jesus. The Father is the one who is empowering, authorizing, and sharing his prerogatives with him. In chapter 9, verse 16, it says, Therefore some of the Pharisees are saying, This man is not from God, because he does not keep the Sabbath. But others were saying, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs. And there was a division among them. Chapter 9, verse 16. So let's get one thing out of the way from the get-go. They know that Jesus is a man. He's a human being. He's a member of the human race. But the Pharisees are saying that this man, this human being, he's not really from God. God has not sent and empowered and authorized this human being because they think that Jesus is breaking the Sabbath. Jesus, of course, has claimed already that he is following the Father who is doing good on the Sabbath. But notice that others, people who are not among the Pharisees, are saying, look, Jesus is performing signs. He's doing miracles, meaning that God must be working through him. So he must be, in some sense, legitimate and authorized by God. They're like, how is it that Jesus, a man, could be a sinner? He's performing and doing signs, works of wonder. And of course, there is a division there, a division over Christology. And then at the end of the gospel in chapter 19, verse 7, the Jews answered him, the Jews answered Pilate, we have a law, and by that law, he ought to die because he made himself out to be the Son of God. That's chapter 19, verse 7. Again, Notice the language that's here. They accuse Jesus of making himself out to be something that they think that he is not. The accusation here is that he made himself out to be the Son of God. They think that Jesus is making this claim that is not actually true. But we know that this claim is true. We've known it from the first chapter when the Spirit has come upon Jesus, thereby anointing him for his role as the Messianic Son of God. We know that the purpose statement of the Gospel of John in chapter 20, verse 31, says that these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. So, by Jesus making this claim, this claim is actually true. They don't believe that this claim is true. They think that Jesus is speaking presumptuously. They think that he is making himself out to be something that he is not. And that is the language that keeps showing up there. The claim is that Jesus is functioning as a prophet, but he's not a real prophet in whom Yahweh has placed his words. They think Jesus is speaking presumptuously. They keep saying he makes himself out to be on par with God. He makes himself out to be something great. He has made himself out to be the Son of God. They think that Jesus' claim is false. They think he's a messianic pretender. But the reality is, Jesus' claim is true, because God really has commissioned him. 
God really has put all things into his hand. God really has given Jesus the authority to judge and to give life. So we can see there that the Jews are kind of on high alert because they think that Jesus is speaking presumptuously and they know that the prophet who speaks presumptuously is to be put to death. And this moves us to our second point, point number two. The Jews seek to arrest and kill Jesus because they presume that he is a false prophet. Again, they see Jesus making these claims that they think that Jesus does not possess the authority to make. But Jesus has never said, I am God. I am the only true God. I am Yahweh. Jesus never said any of those things. So we've already seen in chapter 5, verse 16, for this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. Again, Jesus was doing these things by, in Jesus' own words, imitating what the Father was doing as an obedient son. Two verses later in verse 18, for this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Remember, Deuteronomy 18, verse 20, the prophet who speaks and acts presumptuously is to die. He is to be killed. In chapter 7, verse 1, it says, After these things, Jesus was walking in Galilee, for he was unwilling to walk in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Why are they seeking to kill him? Because that's what you do to a false prophet, according to Deuteronomy chapter 18. A few verses later, in verse 19 of chapter 7, Jesus says, Did not Moses give you the law? And yet, None of you carries out the law. Why do you seek to kill me? A little bit later in that chapter, in verse 30, so they were seeking to seize him. They, of course, want to arrest him so they can put him to death. Two verses later, the Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him, and the chief priest and the Pharisees sent officers to seize him. Chapter 7, verse 44, some of them wanted to seize him. In the next chapter, chapter 8, verse 37, Jesus says that I know you are Abraham's descendants, yet you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. Notice they're trying to kill Jesus because they're not willing to accept Jesus' word. But remember, Jesus' word is not really his. It's not innately his. They are the words that Yahweh has placed into Jesus' mouth, because Jesus is the true prophet whom Yahweh has sent, authorized, and empowered. Because the Jews are not accepting that word, which is Yahweh's word, they are seeking to kill him. They think that Jesus is a false prophet in whom Yahweh has not placed his words. Three verses later, in chapter 8, verse 40, Jesus says, But as it is, you are seeking to kill me, a man. Who told you the truth, which I heard from God. Again, notice, Jesus says that I am speaking this truth to you. I heard it from God. God has put these words in my mouth, but his opponents don't believe what he's saying. Therefore, they're seeking to kill him, as Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 20 has commanded them. But Jesus here unambiguously claims to be a man, a human being, a member of the human race. He's saying, I'm a man in whom God has placed his words, and I'm speaking those things to you, but you're seeking to kill me. Clearly, Deuteronomy 18, verse 20, is completely woven through this entire narrative. At the end of this particular chapter, in chapter 8, verse 59, they picked up stones to throw at him. In chapter 10, verse 31, again, the Jews pick up stones to stone him. They're trying to kill him. They think that he is speaking and acting presumptuously. In verse 39 of that chapter, chapter 10, therefore, they were seeking again to seize him. In chapter 18, verse 12, it says, the Roman cohort and the commander of the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. So they finally got him. They finally seized him. And of course, by the end of the next chapter, Jesus is finally put to death. And he is put to death as a false prophet, someone who claimed messianic privileges, but they felt was 
a real messianic pretender. But the readers of the Gospel of John know that Jesus really is the Messiah. He wasn't a messianic pretender. He really was the prophet in whom Yahweh has placed his words. Now, what's to happen to the followers of Jesus? If the Jews think that Jesus is a dangerous false prophet that's leading the entire world astray, what about Jesus' followers who, after the death and resurrection of Jesus, are going around and telling other people about Jesus and trying to convert Jews to believe and put their trust into this Messiah whom these former Jews think is a false Messiah. Well, that leads us to our third point, point number three. The followers of Jesus are thus kicked out of the synagogues. This is a major theme in the Gospel of John, and it doesn't appear in the three earlier Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And that's because the experience of being kicked out of the synagogue is something that the original recipients of the Gospel of John had actually experienced in their own lifetime. They had confessed that Jesus is the Messiah and that eventually came to a breaking point and the synagogues, at least where they lived, probably in Ephesus, no longer were willing to accept those Jews who believed that Jesus was the Messiah because the synagogue officials and those leaders felt that Jesus was not the Messiah, that he was a false Messiah. So we can see a little bit of this in chapter 9, verse 22, in regard to the blind man who was healed. It says that his parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. That's John chapter 9, verse 22. And so we have this phrase that basically gets invented here in the Gospel of John, aposynagogos, to indicate that those who actually do think that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, then they are to be excommunicated from the Jewish community. In chapter 12, verse 42, it says, Nevertheless, many even of the rulers believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. That's text number two in John 12, verse 42. Again, those who confess Jesus, those who believe in him, those who put their trust in him as the Messiah, the Son of God. They think that he really is the Messiah in whom God has placed his authoritative words. Those persons were getting kicked out of the synagogue. And Jesus warns of this in chapter 16, verse 2. He says, They will make you outcast from the synagogue. But an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering service to God. Chapter 16, verse 2. So not only does Jesus say that his followers are going to be kicked out of the synagogue, but that they are also going to be put to death. Just like Jesus was rejected by the Jewish community, he was seized and he was put to death. They thought that Jesus was a messianic pretender who was presumptuously speaking as a prophet, and they put him to death. And so they thought, well, his followers, we could probably do the same thing to them. And the Gospel of John seems to have been written to give comfort and encouragement and direction to those Jews who were faithful to Jesus, but they had suffered being kicked out of the synagogue. And all of this is because there is this massive Christological portrayal of not only Jesus, but also his opponents in the Gospel of John in light of Deuteronomy chapter 18, particularly verses 15 through 22. So, what have we looked at? Let's summarize. In conclusion, the Christological portrayal of the Johannine Jesus as the prophet like Moses, in whom Yahweh has placed his authoritative words, drawn from Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 through 22, also carries with it a warning for anyone who falsely claims to be a prophet from God. Most of the Jews in the Gospel of John regarded Jesus as 
a messianic pretender who claimed to possess divine prerogatives. This means that Jesus was to be rejected and put to death, based on what Moses said in Deuteronomy 18, verse 20. Within the Gospel of John, Jesus is frequently portrayed by those who do not regard him as God's Messiah as speaking presumptuously, requiring that Jesus be put to death. But Jesus never once claimed to be God. He never called himself God. He never claimed to be Yahweh. Jesus claimed to be the Messiah whom God had sent, whom God had empowered, and whom God had authorized with God's own prerogatives. And this, of course, resulted in Jesus being rejected by those who did not believe such claims. Not only was Jesus rejected, but his followers, his disciples, who continued to claim that Jesus was the true and promised Messiah. These persons were dangerous, and they were in need of being kicked out of the synagogue by the Jewish leaders. However, the narrator of the Gospel of John insists that Jesus is indeed the promised prophet like Moses. Jesus is not some messianic pretender worthy of being put to death. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. Join us next week as we begin to explore how Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 22 has influenced the portrayal of Jesus in the Gospel of John. Please look forward to our next episode. If you enjoy our podcast, please consider supporting us as we aim to promote the sound truths about the oneness and unity of God and about the humanity of Jesus. You can support us absolutely for free by subscribing on YouTube or iTunes, by giving us an honest review on iTunes, and by sharing your favorite episodes with your friends, like this episode. If you'd like to offer a financial donation, you can check out our PayPal link that's associated with this episode. You can also contribute with a membership on YouTube in addition to your free subscription. The Biblical Unitarian Podcast is produced and edited by Dustin Williams. I am Dustin Smith, your host. Until next time, please take care.